Hi there, this is Phil Sinborn from the Back End of Learning Center, and I had a problem. I was played in a tournament in Washington, D.C., and there were several positions that stumped me, and a few of the ones I'm about to show you stumped my opponents as well, or maybe they just stumped my opponents, but when I saw the answer, I really couldn't uh, be sure that I understood the right play and why. So I called on some help from a good friend who was too busy during the tournament because he was winning the Masters, Steve Sachs, who is with me now. Hello, Steve. Hi, Phil. Good afternoon. Good. Good afternoon. And today, uh, by the way, Steve is a member of our Backyard and Learning Center. He's one of our 21 uh, teachers and experts uh, uh, giving lessons in 10 languages around the world. We've really grown. And the beauty of having so many teachers is we're all sharing our ideas and information with each other. So I get a tremendous benefit from having guys like Steve on board who give me ideas and information and help me with lessons and lectures and so on. So that's enough of an advertisement. Let's get right into the uh, uh, the problems that we came up in Washington that Steve is going to help me with. Let's go through them. And uh, notice uh, I simplified many of them by making them either for money or 11 away, 11 away. Some of them did occur at max scores. But in this situation, the score is 0, 0 to 11. The cube is in the center. A blue is on roll and rolls a 6, 5. And obviously, the 5 is forced. He must come in with the 5. The real question now is where do you play the 6? And this is the one that caused me problems. Now, this is a video, so you can pause the video and take as long as you want if you don't want to hear Steve's answer and explanation right away. Uh, and I recommend you do that. Give it some thought what you would do and why. Then come back to the video, and we'll hear uh, what Extreme Gamma and Steve Sachs say. By the way, Steve, did you get all of these right when I sent them to you? Did you Were you right on with all of them, or did you have to do uh, I think I got one or two wrong this time, which uh, is better I than I usually I, do on your quizzes. Yeah, because I, usually I'm only sending you the harder ones, but... Uh, I think I said you eight or nine or ten, and we're only going to do five or six today uh, because just just because I think we took the more interesting ones. By the way, I will also tell you that one of the things I like about the positions I'm showing you today is the answers aren't close. It's clearly right to make one play or another. So let's go back to the original position. Let's see what Extreme Gavin says you should do, and uh, let's hear what Steve has to say. The right play according to Extreme Gamma, and again, it's not close, it's not worth uh, rolling out or anything, is to stay on your opponent's side point and come in. And my opponent, in this case, came out uh, and, and played bar 14 and didn't stay here. Obviously, he was afraid of getting hit on or pointed on here uh, or not having return shots. Steve, what, why is this play right? Well, there's several reasons in my mind. First of all, uh, I like bringing the checker from 11 to 5 in. It's uh, much more where you want to develop. I mean, you could leave the checker outside to make the bar point, but the problem is the chance of you getting hit, that checker is now vulnerable. If you safety it up on the 5 point, it's not like it's doing no good. It's, it's, it's a builder on the 5 point to make it a 4 or 3 or potentially the deuce point. Uh, the secondary reason is that if you stay back on the five point, there are very few numbers that actually point on you. Uh, double fours would be like really the only super bad one, although double aces is pretty strong if blue stays back. But uh, if you stay back on the 20 point uh, and you're hit, you're going to be hit loose more than likely. If your opponent hits you loose on the five point or his five point, you have a direct return. Uh, but if you come out to the 14 point and you're hit, you don't have a direct return. So it's the combination of uh, safety a blot up from 11 to 5. Um, the uh, viability of the builder on the 5 point isn't much better than the, the builder being on the 11 point, but it's, uh, it's safe from harm, it's still functional, and as I said, if you stay back and get hit, you're going to have a direct return, where if you come out, if you come out and get hit, it's uh, it's only an indirect return. I got you, and and I'll just add one other reason to stay there is if he does hit you loose there, he's likely to only have one builder uh, to cover. It's not like he's going to hit you loose and have two or three builders to cover, where you're scared to death he's going to make the five point after hitting you right away. That's not the immediate threat. So another way I've heard this 
put, by the way, is is, uh, is this checker uh, an asset or a threat? Well, it's an asset to some extent in helping you make this point, but it's also a liability uh, because of the possibility of getting hit here, whereas here it's an asset uh, and it's not a liability. So that's another way to look at the advantage of, of this move. Um, one other way to, to look at this that I have learned is a very valuable thing to do is to highlight both plays, right-click, and look at dice distribution. And it gives you a feel for your opponent's next roll on the rolls that hurt you and help you and how much they hurt you and help you. And I don't want to go through this in detail at this point. I'm just going to point out that that's another way to sort of get a feel for what rolls are good for your opponent and what bad rolls are bad for your opponent after each play. And, of course, looking at the final averages are very, not a whole lot more valuable than looking at the equity numbers here. But when you make the best play, your average uh, equity is minus 198, and with a bad play, your minus equity is much worse, about twice as bad. So there's really a big difference in these two plays. Uh, okay, good good job, Steve. Let's go to number two. Uh, there's, another, there's, there's actually another point that I failed to bring up that I can bring up now, and that is uh, on, on the times that you're not hit, which is possibly about a third of the time, you have the option of, uh, well, not the option, the opportunity to make your 20 point. Which is like if he rolls a four one or a five one or a six one, four two. Now you got twenty. You got all fours plus six two to make an anchor, uh, and that's really valuable. So everything seems to be leaning towards uh, playing eleven to five with a five point. Uh, and these are the reasons a, why. Yeah, that's a good point. That's also a common theme. Often we don't want to strand our our, our single checker uh, because we we making an anchor gives us a very strong game. As a matter of fact, it looks like Red's in really great shape here, but how good a shape would he be if we made the five-point acre? It would be pretty huge for Blue uh, to have a five-point acre. Even with all these points that Red makes, uh, having a five-point acre here gives him a big, big game compared to Red's game having two checkers back on the ace, even with all these points made. Let's put, let's put Red on the roll and just see what the equity is here with blue having this anchor. I'm, I'm not sure who's favored here. 35%? Uh, no, it's more than that. It's 40, almost 42%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so blue actually becomes a pretty sizable favorite by making this anchor. So Steve's point is huge. And, you again, you can't make that anchor. You can't make an anchor with one checker. Uh, real good point. I'm glad you thought of that. Uh, number two. And, again, uh, there's about two, four, five, uh, checker plays and then two cube uh, plays. I try to keep these videos under an hour so people don't lose patience. Okay, uh, again, we have we do have a score here, six away, nine away, and red is winning. Uh, and I always use the away score, and I think that's important in XG. If you're not familiar with that, if you right-click on, on that, you can show it as the actual score or the away score. I like to think in terms of a away score, even when I'm playing a match and with the tournament director lets me, I even put the away score down on my score sheet. Some tournament directors think it's okay. I do too. So at any rate, Red is leading, but he has a 5-2 to play from the bar. Again, we have half the play is so forced. That's why I, I had trouble with these plays. When half of it's forced, it's still hard to know which two to play. So you come in with the 5, where's your 2? If you want to take some more time, pause the video. Otherwise, we're going to go right to the answer at the same time. And I'm coming in with the five. And what are you doing with the two, Steve? Well, this is one of the ones I got wrong here. Uh, I like to keep my builders. So uh, I did not play eight to six. I played 20, um, 20 to 18, but then it was the wrong move. So we're going to go over why in just a moment here. All right. First, we'll see what Extreme Gavin says. And there's a big, big difference. Uh, I hated eight. Six also. It's just I've been, you know, everything I've been learning lately is don't make big stacks and avoid these stacks. But here it's right. So why don't you enlighten us? What are you saying? You're saying you're trying to avoid stacks? <laughs> stacks, not stacks. <laughs> oh, okay. Although when, when I come to LA, which is often, and we have a money game, you'll notice I'm at the other table. I do avoid stacks as much as I can, <laughs> but for other, but for other reasons. It's not your breath. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Okay, so why is it right to come out uh, to play this 8-6 instead of coming out to the 8-8? Eight, eight? 
Well, it's partially from uh, a similar reason from the previous problem in that if you get hit, you're going to have a direct return unless your opponent points on you, and that really only occurs with double three and double four, um, with exception of some pick and pass numbers like three one. But uh, you know, so if you stay on the twenty point, uh, they have a minority of maybe half the numbers hit. And if they hit you, you're going to get a direct, direct return shot. If you don't, if they don't hit you, um, you've got a good chance to escape. And uh, race isn't that bad. So if you can escape your back checker, and they still have two back in your board, you you got a fair chance in the game. Uh huh. Now the other thought that I had, or question that I had, is the cube. I think if you come out because there's 24 numbers that hit here without a direct return, I think blue has a double. And if you stay in, I think he doesn't. So the position of the cube is one thing that I think uh, I overlooked when I made this mistake over the board. I was the one that played this wrong. So let's test that. Let's, because that's always going to be something to think about. If you came out to here, there's so many hits, 24 hits, everybody should know right away a six of the one is 24 hits. And let's give blue the roll, and let's see if he has a double. I think he does. I think I checked this. And it's a small double, not huge. But I think it's a double. Yeah, it shows it's a small double. And if you stayed back and made the ugly play or the stacking play or the non-pure play, I don't think Blue has a double because, again, he only hits with a three or an eight. And if he hits, he's hitting, he's leaving a direct return shot. He's only pointing with double one, double three, and double four. Um, so, oops, it is a double. But that isn't the factor. Okay. So the equity is lower, but the volatility seems like it's higher. And I'm not sure because the differential between doubling and not doubling is actually larger in this position where after you made the correct play than it was uh, if you made the um, incorrect play and came out. That's interesting. Well, maybe it's the gamuts. This has 20% gamuts. How many gamuts does this lead to? Oh, you got to go from, go from six back to eight. With a, oh, you're right. You're right. So how many gamuts does this lead to? No, this is 21. This is more gamuts. And, 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 okay, this is a, this is a conundrum for me. I'm going to have to study this some more. I would have thought that, uh, that you would, have, you would have more of a double coming out with all those shots. So I guess this gives another reason why it's better to make the other play. It's better well, to make the I think, XG's play. I think um, there's a the difference that we're talking about is between quantity and quality. So the quantity of hits is greater this way, and the equity for, uh, for blue is higher, but the quality of the position, of Red's position, is stronger if you make this play. So that doesn't necessarily directly make that much sense. But if you knew you were going to be missed, you'd want to play 24-18. Uh, uh, in, in addition to, um, uh, this is a minor factor, but the, all these things add up. Uh, in addition to, um, you know, wh whichever play that... Uh, that red makes with respect to blues double, uh, you want to look at the uh, market losers in good shakes. Um, he has all the hitting numbers after either play, but if you take a look at uh, blues double fives, it's a number that doesn't hit, but it escapes both back checkers and it prepares to attack uh, red's back checker in a game from 20 pips in the race. So you want to look at not only the numbers that hit, but some of your oddball numbers that don't hit that are also good. Uh, good point. So you got to look at everything. That's why this game is so damn hard. Because you got to yeah. think about everything. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the next one. That was really enlightening for me about the cube there. Okay, number, I, it was a number third one for us, but I skipped one from before. Uh, blue to play 6-2. Again, we have not a real major score factor, either way, 6 away. And blue has a 6-2 to play. So again, uh, give it a little thought, see what you would do. Um, and obviously there's there's a hitting play, and obviously there's a coming out play, and then there's 
other plays that you might consider. I can't see too many other plays besides racing and, and hitting. So, uh, let's see what Extreme Gammon comes up with here. Extreme Gammon comes out and hits. So, I think almost everybody hits here. I, I think and it, not hitting is a .3 error. So, let's just assume that we're all good enough to hit as my opponent was in this situation. And now the question is the six. And that's what he got wrong. And why why is coming out better than the other sixes? For example, hitting twice, which is very tempting, or bringing another builder, which is very tempting. Why is this more important, Steve? Okay. Um, the basic theme that I teach in Backgammon, and it's uh, in the article that I wrote that's in the United States Backgammon Federation magazine, is uh, backgammon as easy as one, two, three. And the three things that you want to focus on with respect to checker play is can you hit your opponent's checker, you know, in a positive way? Can you escape his territory? And uh, what was the third one? Boy, that sounds, sounds like, you know, Rick, that sounds like Rick Carrier. I can't remember the Department yeah. of Energy. Uh, can, you, uh, can you escape? Can, can you make a new point? point? Yeah. Right. So those are the three things that you want to uh, you want to focus on. And if you can do more than one of those things in the same move, it's usually going to be correct. So in this case, we can hit and we can escape uh, as opposed to just hitting alone. Uh, and the reason why hitting on the two-point, I think, is wrong is that uh, gammons are not activated due to the cube being in the center. Oh, it's a match. It's a match play. So uh, gammons are activated. But in any case, I don't really like hitting past the anchor deep in my board because you don't, it, you can't really gain enough, usually. So this play, escaping your opponent's board, you don't have to worry too much about a counterattack here, uh, because we'll have him outboarded 3-2, to two, uh, and if he comes in off the bar and hits you loose, unless it's like a double fives, uh, you're going to be, you're going to have reasonable chances. So hitting and escaping are uh -huh. two positive things at the same time. Okay, and again, one of the major reasons you want to escape here is that you you do have a situation where you could get you could crush. You could be rolling some double fours and double fives and and double threes and start getting into trouble. Uh, those checkers aren't going to be that easy to get out later. And getting him out while he's got a checker on the bar, uh, like you said, it's not that dangerous uh, to give up this anchor when he's got a checker on the bar. So, yeah, so that's a very good point, Bill. I, I didn't bring up that point of uh, uh, busting, uh, blue busting their position. So uh, so it's not only the functionality of escaping, but it's avoiding uh, busting your position as well. Uh-huh. Gotcha. Okay, good one. Next one is number six. And... Here, again, uh, eight away, four away. I, I don't know that the score matters that much, but uh, but Blue is uh, uh, winning, and, and he has a 5-4 to play. And, again, there are a few optional plays. What play do you make? Give it some thoughts, pause the video, and then we'll see what's right. I assume this play wouldn't change much for money or at different scores. I don't think the score is a huge factor here. But let's go with it anyway. All right, the right play, and again, this is a play that my opponent missed, was coming up with the four. It looked pretty uh, scary. Uh, and I can understand why people won't come up with this four, because you have one, two, three, four, sixteen pointing numbers right away, uh, plus double fours is 17 pointing numbers. Uh, by coming up, uh, and it looks like bringing a couple down would give you some nice builders. So why is it right to come up, Steve? Okay, so um, quite a few reasons here that I can think of. One is this, the race is really close, uh, and you want to try and get to the race before you can actually achieve it. And by staying back, you have no numbers that escape. If you just stay back on the 24 point, you couldn't get out with anything. You couldn't get out with 6-5 with double fours. But by moving forward here, you give yourself an opportunity to escape. Uh, now, it's true that um, Red has uh, 17 numbers to point on you here. Well, let's be positive. Uh, that means they have 19 numbers that don't point on you. Uh, additionally, the glass, is also, the glass is also half full, and most of us look at the glass half empty. <laughs> Good point. That's right. 
in addition to that, Red does have uh, four builders to point on you, but only three. one of them is active. So he's stripped on his 7 point, 8 point, and 10 point, which means that if unless he rolls a double, uh, if he's going to point on you, like 3-2, for example, would be kind of risky. I mean, you would do it. Well, maybe you wouldn't do it. Maybe you would just make the 11 point. But in any case, let's say you chose to uh, make the 5 point with a 3-2, You'd be leaving uh, five indirect numbers. No, excuse me. You'd be leaving 11 indirect numbers to get hit back. That's equivalent to a single direct shot. Uh, another way to look at it, and another way to look at it is, is that uh, let's uh, if you let's say you get pointed on, well, you're still you're still 89% um, to come in, and if you had not moved up, you you know you would be back on your opponent's one point. By moving up, at least you give yourself an opportunity. You'd be a favorite uh, not to get pointed on. And even if you did get pointed on, you'd be getting sent back, but that's where you were in the first place. So you haven't really lost too much other than half a roll. And in this case, uh, since you know your opponent would probably only be making the second point in this board, most of the time that's not going to make a difference, much of one anyway. Uh -huh. Well, you illustrated another good point, because you started out by talking about the race, and, and one of the things we teach always is when you're doing, uh, you're coming up with your check and play reasoning, first start with your game plan. Are you racing, timing, hitting, or playing a holding game? Those are the four different game plans that we've defined, and primarily pr pr racing, timing, and hitting is what most people are used to, and even though you're uh, the race is close, it's still probably your best game plan because you're not going to prime red, he's gone. You're a uh, hitting game, you have to get a shot, and your board isn't that good after making the three-point for a hitting game to be a, a, a really great game. So even though you're not way ahead in the race, and even though race isn't necessarily a way you're going to win, it, it appears to be probably the best game plan you have right now. So you, when you, once you realize that racing is a viable game plan, the coming up is much more of a no-brainer. Now, one of the things that Steve said also really hit me, and that's that these points are stripped and that if he does use a 1, 3, or a 5 to make this point, he's probably leaving a blot. But what if they weren't stripped? I, I looked at this, and I already know the answer, and I was a little surprised. In this case, they're not stripped. He's got a lot more numbers. He's got these two that aren't stripped, and it's still right to come up. That surprised me. I, I thought that that might be enough to push it back down. But uh, in most in most stores or in normal stores, it's still right to come up, even though you're losing the race more, because it's still your best chance. It does give you some outfield control, and it's your best chance to get this checker moving. Now, the difference becomes much smaller, and it actually becomes pretty close. But uh, it's taking a little time here because I hit plus plus. But I think, I think this would surprise a lot of people. Uh, you just don't have much of a game back on the one point, and you're giving him freedom to use these two checkers uh, that are on his 10 point with, with an impunity. If he rolls a 5 or a 6, he can make either of these points and leave a block here. So he has even more ways that he's going to make these points. And another thing that Steve didn't mention is whether you're on the one point or the five point, if he makes the five point, you got a pretty lousy game anyway. You're in big trouble. So you're going up there hoping he doesn't make the five point is the idea. Let's see. You, know, you should be done. So come on, XG. Uh, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm well, here, wrong. here's, uh, you know, in, in, in your technique here, what, what did you change about the position? You brought two checkers off the midpoint to this eight and seven? Is that what you did the from the no I, took, no, I took one from the midpoint to here, and I took one from the six point to here. But I think the position that I did before, I changed it a little bit. It okay, so you, so you, gained, so right. you gained four pips for red. You need to compensate blue and give them four pips somehow in order to equalize the position somewhat. So take I it, maybe take it. I don't know that that's going to make enough of a difference, but. No, no, no. Oh, what another difference? Option. He's got another okay, option. Yeah. There, but, yeah, very good. That's what I was just going to suggest there. Yeah, but it is, it's close now. There are, I, the way I ran it before, maybe I took the two checkers off of here, and it was still right to come up, and, and, and this particular position, it wasn't. So I can see now with the, with the race far enough behind that you don't. But, I, again, I wish I had to save the position that surprised me where I put two builders here. Maybe I, maybe I moved them both from the sixth point so it didn't help us gain that much, and we had 
more like this one didn't help the race. But it was still pretty right to come up to, to get this checker moving. So uh, leaving the checker on the one point is just not a great place for this checker right now. That's, that's a major point. Okay, let's go on. Uh, number seven, the last checker play. Um, six one for blue. Again, I'd put this in as a money game with the cube in the center. So blue's got a six one. And um, pretty obvious, you can hit and make the ace point or you can make the bar point. I don't think anybody would consider anything but those two plays. So what's better, making the ace point, hit and make the ace point, or make your bar point? Dave, what would you do here? Okay, well, uh, this is one I, I did get right. Uh, I decided that uh, I would hit from 8 to 2 and make the ace point 2 to 1. Huh? Okay. And my, this, this my reason for happen. it was... What's that? Go ahead. <laughs> my reason for it was that you stop Red from playing both of his uh, numbers. Uh, if you just make your own bar point as blue, probably about half the numbers are going to be pretty functional here to make either your own... Uh, you know, that if blue makes his own bar point, so for Red uh, to make either his 7 points, 5 point, 4 point, or 3 point, or an anchor, uh, it's going to be a decent-sized majority of, uh, of good numbers. If you just, uh, well, if you decide to hit and pass, you take half a roll away from Red. Now Red, Red can't make an, a new point unless he rolls a double off the bar, and, you know, there's only five of those. No, only four of those, because he's making a, uh, these ace points. Only double, two, three, four, and five would be able to make a new point inside his own board, uh, and uh, Red could make an advanced anchor with any 3, 4, 1, or 5, 2. Mm -hmm. so I want to stop him from having the opportunity to do those things. Uh, good things like double ace, 3, 1, 4, 2. I want to stop him from uh, being able to do the strong uh, uh, offensive uh, maneuvers by uh, putting him on the bar. Uh-huh. Steve, how long and he's going to dance eleven percent of the time. Steve, how, how long have you been playing backgammon? Oh my goodness, uh, I've years. been playing tournament backgammon for forty years. Okay, so forty years ago, would you have made this point? Definitely not. Yeah, <laughs> and, and this is one of the ways the game has changed. Before the bots, all of the experts thirty, forty years ago tried to play pure backgammon by keeping your checkers in, in play putting them where they want to be. Uh, the girl likes to talk about, I listen to the checkers and they tell me where they want to be. They sure don't want to be on the ace point. And they don't want you making the ace point. And what the bots have taught us now that if you do have to go to the ace point, and here, it's not always wrong, by the way, if Blue had rolled a 4-1 last time to hit 2, going to the ace point was okay. It's, in fact, it's the right place in a lot of these situations. But once you slot that ace point, now, more than ever, it's right to make it. We're finding out that the ace point is an asset. Now, after Blue makes the ace point, his best game plan is a hitting game because the ace point is really going to hurt him from priming because it's hard to prime after you put those two checkers there. Uh, and it's hard to race and bring checkers home to the ace point because you don't have as many other points made. So you really want to play a blitzinger hitting game after that, or, or if you can just race safely, that's fine. But I think this is a, a, thing, a, a play that... The fellow that I was playing that got this wrong had been playing for many years as well. And I'm telling you that if you learned this game 20, 30 years ago and you haven't studied since then and read the latest books and worked with XG or taken lessons, you're going to get a lot of plays wrong that have changed. And you can see the, the difference is not insignificant. Did you go along with all I just said, Steve? Yeah. Uh, and another point that you brought up, which I like, is the fact that if you don't make your race point, that checker is a liability. It's just sitting there, uh, and it's either going to be a liability in that you may get a hit later, which you don't want to, or it's out of play, and it's not serving any purpose. So unless you're getting already bearing off or, you know, you're already home, anytime you have a checker on your own one point, it's generally a liability. Yeah, so if you've got a reasonable opportunity to cover, and here you have a, not only do you have a good cover, but you're taking away half his roll and hitting him, it's clearly right to do that. It, just to stay with that point for one second, let's just take the opening roll of a 5-3. When I learned to play 
a 5-3, it was very, very wrong to make my three-point. In fact, I was yelled at when I did it one time. And look, I was told to bring two down from the 13. It's a point only six wonder to do it the way I was taught when I started uh, taking lessons 30, 40 years ago. So, uh, again, you really you can see there's some very big differences, even in the opening role. So you got to keep up with this game. And that's why uh, if you look at the top of the Giants list and you look at the top players, uh, even guys like Falafel, who's been playing 40 and 50 years, Falafel's still a great player today because he's never stopped studying. He's, you got to keep learning. And that's, that's, why, that's why this game is so much fun. Okay, now we've got a couple of key positions that we blew. I blew one and my opponent blew one. Uh, this is a score situation, eight away, six away. So red is eight away. He is losing by a little bit in this match. Blue is on roll, and blue is thinking about whether he should double. And so the question is, should blue double? And if blue double, should red take or pass? Again, give it some thought. Pause the video if you need to. And the way I always approach this is I ask first what I would do for money, and then I see if the score makes me lean one way or the other uh, because of the score, uh, because I'm just so used to playing for money. By the way, Steve, do you approach it the same way, or do you immediately start thinking in terms of score? Um, well, if there's an, enough points in the match remaining, you know, like uh, six or more from each side, I kind of look at it as, you know, sort of like a money game, and then maybe make some small adjustments. But once both players have... I mean, four points or fewer, I immediately start thinking about, you know, match uh, conditions. Two-way, yeah, three-way, two-way, yeah. four-way, one-way, two-way, proper. And at those, at those scores that were, were, uh, where you're talking now, that's where the, the, the doubling team decisions change can tremendously because of the gambling values and because of the take points. Okay, so has everybody decided what you would do here? If you blue, do you double? If you red, do you take your pass? Steve, did you get this one right? I got part of it right. I thought it was a take, but I also thought it was a double. And as it turns out, um, it's not a double. Uh, you know, you would think with a 25-pip lead, having your opponent outboarded 4-2, to two, and them having two checkers on the bar, it'd be good likelihood that it's a double. And But the problem is, is that blue only needs six, and red needs eight. So... By giving up the cube here, you give uh, your opponent an opportunity to double the cube back and potentially gamble you and win the match. So you got to be a little bit careful with respect to the score here. In addition, the position, you know, threes and fives don't play too well for blue here. Uh, double fives isn't exactly a nightmare at the moment because it does bring builders into play, but it puts a lot of pressure on blue to be able to release one of his back checkers with a 2-4 or 6, like, immediately. Uh-huh. Let's just out of curiosity, let's see what this looks like for a money game. Uh, the Jacoby rule might affect them. I'm going to take the Jacoby rule off because I don't want that to affect the uh, the, the analysis because I want to keep it closer. And that's what I usually do. I want to keep it closer between match and money play. Look at this. For money, even without the Jacoby rule, it's right on the edge. It, this zero 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 means... You can flip a coin whether you double or not. So you're 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 right on, Steve. When you say the score is a real factor in this position, and the score kept it from being a double. Now I think you might find it interesting that I made a real mistake in this one. I doubled, but the good news is my opponent passed. So uh, this is a great position for Wolsey's law. This is one of the reasons why all of our teachers. Uh, insist on Wolsey's law. If you're blue, the first thing you think about is if you're red, are you sure it's a take or a pass? Well, if you're a good player, you should be sure this is a take. But lots of people would think this might be a pass. This is kind of scary. Uh, this is kind of scary for red uh, in this position. And maybe you'll get a pass. So uh, for that reason, if you're on the fence of whether to double or not, unless you're playing Steve Sachs or Mochi or or one of these great giants that you, and is not likely to make a mistake, it's not such a horrible thing to gamble it up. So I made a 7% mistake, and my opponent made a 36% mistake. So um, it wasn't such a horrible mistake after all to double this thing, because I have to tell you, I thought it was a take, but I, I, I wouldn't have bet my life on it being a take. I had a little bit of doubt in me, and that's what made me double. So uh, 
thank goodness I wasn't on the other side and hadn't decided whether to take because I might have made that same really huge blunder. Uh, this is a, a, a tough position. And this is looks very scary for, for Red because if Blue does start moving these back checkers right away, if he rolls twos and sixes and fours, it looks like to look pretty bad for Red unless he comes, starts coming in right away. But these are the kind of positions that I don't think very many people can understand. Steve Sachs has been playing 50 years and has put in quite a few hours, and so have I. We can sort of visualize how this game's going to play out. Even if Blue rolls uh, a 6-2 and starts moving his back checkers, it's not going to take very long before Red's got both checkers in. And now Blue's got to be very careful about leaving blocks. And now Blue might still have one or two checkers in, in, in red side of the board. So we can visualize that. If you can't visualize that, you can't see why red has to take, then put this in against Extreme Gammon and play it against Extreme Gammon ten times, and you'll start to see why it's a big take. If you don't know how to do that, set up, play from position, make yourself red and make Extreme Gammon blue, and go, and then play it again, over and over and over again. Okay, last one. Another cube problem. Uh, and this is really not much of a score situation. Uh, ten away, ten away. Blue is on roll, should blue double. And if blue doubles, should red take her pass? <coughs> I'll give, give, you, give you a little bit of time here. All right, Steve, did you get this one right? No, I did not get it right, and uh, my assessment of the position was is that uh, both sides have a three-point board, and the Reds ahead in the race. But what I didn't look at uh, sufficiently enough was the volatility of the position. That's one of the main factors uh, in this cube decision is volatility. So the number of numbers which uh, Blue can point on Red here or... For example, roll a 6-4 and hit uh, the fly shot is enough to push it into the double territory, and pretty strongly so as well. Uh, I didn't like the fact that Blue had their ace point made, but uh, Red also has some weakness in their position as they have um, some, they don't, they don't have their four point, their four point is slotted. If you move the checker from the three back to the four, you know, I mean, it's a pretty solid double by 184. Uh, it's possible this won't be a double. I'm not sure if that much of improvement for red is going to change it to a massive double to a no double. It's a good chance it's still a small double. No, no, a massive no I mean, it's double. not a double. So, that, but that's that's such that's such an amazing improvement for the position. Now, now red has a strong four point board as opposed to having a three-point board with the piece kind of out of play. So what may be a seemingly a small difference uh, in this case is pretty major. So, uh, yeah, just look at, look at how the numbers play. Uh, like, do a dice distribution in your own mind before, you know, because when you're at the table, you, you don't have access to XG. You can't look at dice distribution. But uh, look at how the numbers play. Go through the numbers. And uh, what is the John O'Higgins says if you got... 10 market losers, then a uh, good chance you have a double. And well, so nine, you, nine, nine net market losers, according to O'Hagan's law, and you have a double. Okay. But John is, John is very careful to point out something that you pointed out. It depends on the volatility. And, and for those of you who might not be familiar with that term, by that we mean how big a swing there can be in the equity uh, after the next roll. Now, there are some positions, for example, in a race where where unless you roll double sixes or something huge, the, the equity, the winning chances for both sides is not likely to swing or change that much. But in a situation like this, if blue hits this checker and then red doesn't come in, we have gotten a situation where red went from, you know, from maybe winning the game 40, 38 or 40 percent of the time down to 20 percent of the time. So the swing could be really, really huge. This is very, very volatile. So you don't need to have as many market losers. So you have, in this case, it shows you that 40% of the time you're going to lose your market. Uh, that's a 40% market loser. That's a lot. 
uh, of times where you lose the market, and it actually shows you your best rolls, double four, double five, double three, and it also shows you your bad rolls. Now, the ratio of bad rolls to good rolls here, you can see, is pretty strong, and you also have to look at where the good rolls hit. Most of your good rolls, everything that's in green, is about 80%. And even if you roll a really, really bad roll, which you would hate if it happened, if you double and you roll one of these bad rolls, there's not one of them where you're still not a favorite in the game. You're still, even with your worst roll, you're still favorite to win this game. So you're not happy you doubled, you're not happy he has the cube, but how unhappy are you if you didn't double and you got to 130? What does that mean? That means that in addition to just winning, the gammons are going to give you a lot of extra value as well. So um, this nice distribution... Uh, like Steve says, we can't do this over the board, but if you do something like this in your mind and then check it, I know people who are able to pretty much duplicate this in their mind. Uh, I'm sure Steve can if he took enough time over the board. We didn't play with clocks. In fact, when we didn't play with clocks, Steve was notorious for taking his time, and I was sitting there wondering what he's thinking about, and I found out later on that he's thinking about a whole bunch of things that never occurred to me that he should be thinking about, like what happens with every roll. So... Uh, that's why we have clocks now, because we can't let the game get too boring if it goes that long. But you can pretty well do this fairly quickly. Steve pointed out real quick that a 6-4 hits. We also know that every 3 hits. We know that 2-1 hits. We know the numbers that point on this very quickly. So we can see that there's a lot of great rolls that destroy red or hurt them tremendously. And then what about rolls that really hurt you tremendously? Not that many. There's some rolls that aren't so hot. Which we already looked at some of them. What happens if you roll a two, well, uh, uh, what's a bad roll here? A two, five, uh, 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 four, four, one. There are some rolls that do really nothing good for you, but they don't destroy you. So that's why it's a double and Again, uh, I missed this cube over the board. I made a mistake here by not doubling and... I did the same thing that Steve did also. One of the things I hated about my position was making the ace point that the ace point is made. So um, we're finding out, again, that's the prejudice that Steve and I have because we learned the game long ago when we were, we were constantly preached that the ace point is terrible. And we're finding out it's not as bad as we thought. It still has great uh, value and assets. For one thing, our opponent can never be on a race point when we get to a bear off. We know how bad that is. So even if it does nothing else but that, it, it, it adds value to blue side. Any other comments about this one, Steve? Um, well, I mean, it, it, with respect to the volatility, I think I counted up that blue has got 21 good numbers, the numbers that either hit um, di uh, directly with a 3, hit with a 6-4, point on red, or just something that escapes like double sixes. So uh, 20, and not, 20 and numbers, that's four. And let's not forget 5-5 five, five that hits and makes the point. It's yeah, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Point. Yeah, some awesome rolls like that. Mm -hmm. So with 21 great numbers, that means that you have, there's 36 possible rolls of the dice, there's 15 numbers left, and if those 15 numbers aren't too bad, it almost always has got to be a double. So... After have, So you and I both got this one wrong, Steve, and probably because we examined it, next time we'll get it right, and I also didn't know what you pointed out that this would make that big a difference. It is monstrous how big a difference it is that Red now has a solid board, that he doesn't have a block, and that he doesn't have these two checkers, uh, you know, this checker out of play. So that that's a feature that will set off alarms for me in the future. I'm going to double much faster when I see something like this than when I see something like this. How many people put enough weight on these things? So that's why working with XG, looking at the numbers, and moving the checkers around. Uh, what Steve just did is, is absolutely brilliant. If you don't look at variations, number one, you won't fully understand the first position that you saw, and number two, you won't remember it as well. And number three, you won't be able to apply what you learned over the board as well. So that's one of the things I also learned recently with working with Mochi. Mochi takes a position, for example, he in the last boot camp, he took a three-point holding game, and he did 15 variations of it. He's probably got another 30 variations he didn't show us. But by showing slight variations each time, 
is able to get a feel for everything, every situation when you have a three-point holding game, for when it's a double and when it's not a double, and when you run and when you stay, because you do the variation. So that's the other key uh, as part of what we call deliberate practice to learning. Now, we can help you with that. That's, Steve is an expert teacher, and I've got a lot of really great expert teachers, and I am going to go back to my ad, go to the, uh, the backgammonlearningcenter.com, and you'll see that uh, we've got to have a teacher in, in virtually every language. We're up to 10 languages now. And if you come up with an 11th language and you need a teacher, I'll find them for you. So I uh, hope to see you sometime soon. We'll hope to see you in a tournament soon. Steve, again, congratulations on winning the Masters in, uh, um, in Washington. And I know that's no big deal for you because you've won so many tournaments with so many Masters. You've got one of the best records in the world. And all I can tell you is keep it up. Pleasure working with you. Well, I, uh, I played Kit Wolsey in the finals, and with respect to using Wolsey's law, law against Kit Wolsey, I just simply asked him, Kit, are you thinking or not? And he <laughs> laughed. That's the best way to use Kit Wolsey's law. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's easier to just ask him. To ask Kit Wolsey if he's thinking or not. That's very clever. I love your sense yeah. of humor. I love working with you. And thanks so much for your help and for donating your time uh, on this video. I'll talk to you again soon. Let me, uh, Thank you, Phil. Shut up.